top tax write-offs for rental property. Let's get into it. Now, this video is focused purely on real estate. Okay, so I assume that you are either one, a current real estate investor, or two, you are seriously considering becoming a real estate investor by owning your own single family property, or maybe getting into a real estate syndication by investing with another group of people. So I personally love real estate and I'm in a few real estate syndications and I have done taxes for hundreds of real estate investors. And real estate can be a great way to build long-term wealth, earn additional income, and generate a tax shelter. And because of that, in this video, I'm gonna break down the top tax write-offs for rental property in 2021. And I'm gonna give you some deductions and some write-offs that no one else is talking about. And if they are, I promise to break it down in a more simple way that everyone can understand. Stay tuned. Hey, I'm Sean with Life Accounting, the accounting company that saves people from high taxes and low profits. As always, if you find any value from this video, even an incy wincy bit, please hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm so other people like you can learn more about tax write-offs for rental properties. And while you're at it, subscribe if you wanna learn more about how to reduce your taxes and maximize your profits. Now, before we get started, I just wanna clarify that you may hear me use the phrase tax deductions and tax write-offs interchangeably in this video and maybe even in other videos as well. And guys, it's basically the same thing, all right? Tomato, tomato, okay? At the end of the day, what we're trying to accomplish is to make sure that we're using all the legal ways to reduce our taxable income that we report to the IRS. Hey, Sean, look, it's the IRS. All right, so when it comes to tax write-offs for rental properties, you need to know the difference between getting tax deductions as an active real estate investor and a passive real estate investor. Because the IRS treats passive income and active income differently for tax purposes. All right, so let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into this. So number one, what is passive income from real estate? So in general, real estate investments are considered to be passive income because revenue is generated from money that you invested. Usually how it works is you go out and you get a loan, which you use your own money to put down a down payment, and then you use that loan to get a rental property and then find a tenant that will pay you every month. So basically, without the money, you likely would not have been able to acquire the rental property, so it's treated as passive income, even guys, if you're actively maintaining the property. On the other hand, money that you trade your time for like a job is considered to be active income. And remember that because it's gonna come full circle here in just a second. All right, let's talk about number two. What is active income from real estate? So the IRS considers someone who works 750 hours per year in the real estate industry as an active real estate professional. And I did the math, okay? And 750 hours is about 20 weeks at 40 hours per week. So basically you need to work about half a year to be considered a real estate professional for tax purposes. Also, if you're a full-time developer or you're a full-time real estate agent that is paid on commissions only, then you're also considered to be a qualified real estate professional. Okay, so why is this important? Why would someone want to be an active real estate investor instead of a passive real estate investor? Well, because these tax write-offs that I'm gonna share with you today have the potential to drive a loss on your property even if you have positive cash flow, which allows you to reduce your tax liability to zero or even negative. Okay, so here's the catch. If you're getting passive income and then you generate a passive loss from all the tax write-offs that I'm gonna share with you today, then that can only be applied to your passive income if you're a passive real estate investor. For example, if you make $1,000 of passive income and then you have a passive loss of $2,000, then your net passive income will be zero, which will still be a great thing because you don't pay anything in taxes and you can carry that loss to the next year. So you won't lose, well, 
<laughs> your loss. All right. However, if you are an active real estate professional, then you can apply your active real estate income against your rental property loss. So yes, real estate investors and professionals live the tax dream. Oh, losses. What are those? All right, so there is one exception, which leads us to our first tax deduction for real estate investors. So if you are making $100,000 or less, you can still write off $25,000 a year in your passive rental real estate losses to be applied to any active income that you have. And if your income goes above 100,000, then the deduction goes down by 50 cents for every dollar of income until it eventually phases out at about $150,000 a year. And that $25,000 deduction is enough to put you in a lower tax bracket. So that's definitely some huge tax savings. All right, so tax write-off for rental properties number two, the 1031 exchange. Currently, the law allows investors to defer paying real estate gains if they reinvest the proceeds of the property within six months of the sale. So in theory, what you can do is sell a real estate property at a gain, then reinvest all the profits to buy a new home at greater value and then avoid paying any capital gains taxes. And when you die, you could even pass the property on to your heirs completely tax free. Now, at the time of making this video, there is a proposal coming out from the president to remove the 1031 exchange for people who have real estate profits of more than $500,000. And they want to ensure that tax loophole will be closed by taxing capital gains on inherited assets as well. Now, whether this proposal is approved or not is left to be seen, but if you want to learn more about capital gains taxes, then I'll link a video up above and in the description below that breaks it all down. All right, tax write-off number three, repairs. Okay, warning, warning, warning. If you already know about this deduction, then take a couple minutes to listen to this because I promise you it's gonna be worth it. So in general, yes, you can write off things like fixing a garbage disposal or patching holes up in a wall for your rental property. But people often misclassify their repair costs on their tax return, which can be a red flag for the IRS if you ever go through any kind of audit. For example, if you buy a house for let's say $100,000 and then you spend $30,000 to renovate the kitchen, you may not deduct that full $30,000 that year. That's because the IRS will view that as a capital improvement and viewing that you bought that house instead of for $100,000, for $130,000. So my general rule of thumb is that if you're paying a really high amount for any type of repair or maintenance cost that you see, then make sure it's not viewed as a capital improvement that improves the value of the overall house. Because again, that can trigger an audit. Now, according to the IRS publication 527, here are some things that should be capitalized. Bedroom additions, landscaping and sprinkling systems, storm windows, new roofs, installed security systems, heating and AC systems, water heaters, new flooring and insulations. All right, it goes even deeper than that, but those are the main things that you need to be aware of. All right, now let's go ahead and move into tax write-off number four, legal fees. I want to bring this up early on because a lot of people avoid getting into real estate because of this very reason, right? They fear the eviction process or they fear that somebody will sue them in their rental property. So if this is you, you should know that any legal fees that are associated with stuff like evictions or defending yourself in court or even just writing up a strong lease agreement all these expenses can be used as a tax write-offs, so at the very least, you can likely preserve your capital investment if you do run into legal issues. All right, tax write-off for rental properties number five, depreciation. Now, most of our tax write-offs require that you actively spend money or cash flow from your property, but depreciation is different. It's one of the few deductions that can put you in a loss while keeping you in positive cash flow. Usually people think about their home as an investment that appreciates over time, but as a rental property, it's treated more like a business asset which depreciates 
over time. And most business assets eventually reach a point where the asset is no longer in a useful lifespan because real estate investors need to continue to attract high quality tenants and keep up with the rental rates in the area, then they may need to improve certain aspects of their home, like the floors or the paint, et cetera. And because of that, you can take a depreciation deduction every single year. Now it is important to note that you must have a property for at least a year to qualify for depreciation. And as a bonus tip, you need to know about depreciation recapture. So if you sell a property for more than the depreciated value, then the IRS may hand you a 25% recapture tax. For example, if you bought a house for $100,000 and it appreciates to $150,000, then you may have to pay a 25% tax on that $50,000 gain. All right, sometimes this tax can happen even if you don't claim depreciation. So it's best to take advantage of depreciation every single year on your rental property that you can. All right, tax write-off number six, mortgage interest. Okay, so most people will have a loan that charges them interest on their rental property. And I've seen a lot of real estate sheets analyzing cash flow, but you should know that mortgage interest can be deducted 100% from all your rental income. So basically, if you think about it, you're kind of getting a loan tax-free as long as you can put a tenant in there that can pay you every single month on time. And usually around January or February, you're gonna get a form 1098 from your lender that shows you exactly how much interest you paid. And all you have to do is add that to your Schedule E, which is the residential tax form for rental property owners. All right, tax write-off number seven, property taxes. Now this is one I've seen people frequently overlook when it comes to deductions. I constantly have to remind people to give me their property tax payments for their last tax year. And this is a tax write-off that actually applies to personal property, commercial property, and of course, rental properties. So this is one you got to remember to take every single year if you own any real estate. But I do have to mention there is a limit on property tax deductions for personal use, which extends up to $10,000 if you're married filing jointly. Now this limit does not apply to active businesses like rental properties, for example. All right, moving on to tax write-off for rental properties number eight, wages for employees and independent contractors. So if you hire a property manager or a maintenance man, you can deduct their wages on your Schedule E against your passive real estate income. All right, this will also apply to independent contractors like electricians, lawn care companies, or even carpenters. Of course, if your plans are to build a big real estate company, then you can deduct the wages of your employees like if you hired an asset manager or a real estate agent as well. All right, moving along to tax write-off number nine, the home office deduction. If you have a space in your home where you're conducting any type of rental business conversations or work, which I assume that everyone does, then you definitely need to take advantage of the home office deduction. Now I won't dive deep into this because Crystal did a video recently completely dedicated to the home office deduction, which I'll link up above and in the description below. But if you wanna quickly find out how to use and calculate your home office deduction, here's what you can do. Number one, calculate your office space square footage and then divide that by the entire square footage of your house. Or two, use the prescribed rate multiplied by the allowable square footage used in the home. And for 2020, the prescribed rate is $5 per square footage with a maximum of 300 square feet. So for example, if your home office measures at 150 square feet, then your deduction would be $750, which is at 150 times five. And remember, the space must be used for rental or other related business activities. All right, tax write-off number 10, capital gains exclusions. The last write-off I wanna to touch on is the capital gains tax exclusion. Some of you may know that the capital gains tax rate is going up for people that make more than $1 million per year, which is only like 0.03% of the population. So the capital gains exclusion basically applies to mostly everyone. So as long as you live in your house for two of the last five years, then you can sell your primary residence for up to $250,000 more if you're single than what you bought it for. And if you're married, you can sell your primary residence up to $500,000 more than what you bought it for completely tax 
free. That is more specifically capital gains tax free. Okay, so if you're one of those people who are interested in house hacking or house flipping by moving into a property, renovating it yourself, and then selling it later, then this will be a great approach and a great strategy for you to build your wealth with real estate. Okay, now if you wanna learn more about capital gains taxes and my personal opinion on how the new proposal that is coming up may impact you, then make sure you watch my capital gains tax video coming up next. And as always, thank you so, so much for watching. Subscribe, like, and keep on learning, and I'll be along with you.